going on, Mesa? Welcome to Last Down, the show for the sports fan made by the sports fan. I'm Joe Wazer, and to my left is my co-host, Bryce Reedy. We have a jam-packed show today, filled with recaps and a little bit of controversy. We will recap both men's and women's soccer, as well as preview basketball and talk about football snub from the NCAA football playoff. But like the gentlemen we are here at Last Down, we will have the ladies go first, so let's start off with women's soccer. In the 2014 season, the Lady Mavs won only a single game, but this season was a more successful one in year two of the Jason Clare era. The Mavs won four games, including going on a three-game win streak late in the season. My question to you, Bryce, is how much did the Mavs improve this season? Well, you know, the, the Mavs coming into this season, there was nowhere to go but up. They only won one game on the entire season the year before. And to win three games in the year, I think that's a vastly improvement. I mean, I know it's only two more games than they did last year, but they were in way more games this year than they had been in the previous season of Jason Clare's first year tenure. They, were, they ended up tying a total of five games on the season, and so they were in it a lot of the time, and even a lot of their losses only came by one goal. So, I mean, to, to say that you didn't get blown out a majority of the season with the fact being that your roster is a majority uh, freshman and sophomore class, underclassmen, I think that's a vastly improvement. And, you know, from the beginning of the season, you know, you could have said coming in that those first early games, they did look like they struggled. But a lot of that was because they were so young, so they're trying to get used to the system, used to the playing style and everything like that. And then to say that you went down the stretch and in your final four games you won three of them, I'd say that's pretty good. And to say the fact that Sarah Pope was one of the big leaders on this team, that's an understatement, I think, as well, because she was one of the few players on this team that made an impact in every game from the beginning of the season to the end of the season. And she knew what it was like last season and to go in and lose just about every single game and not even be in a, in a competition. You, they were getting blown out left and right. But so coming into this season, I think there was nowhere to go but up, and I think that they've successfully did that. I have to agree with you on that. They did a fantastic job. Obviously, record-wise, they improved, and that's obvious improvement there. But just in the fact that at, late in the season, at least, they finally found their scoring boots because this, mm -hmm. this was the same issue that haunted them at the beginning of the season as well as the 2014 season. They had no problem putting shots on goal or, and shots everywhere on the offensive side. The issue is that none of them found the back of the net. And really, throughout the early part of the season, they missed a lot of key opportunities. They tied 0-0 with Dallas Baptist here earlier in this, uh, at Walker Field. They were the number nine team in the nation at that point. Imagine if one of those shots that they made, especially late on, they had a couple of clear-cut chances, would have made it into the back of the net. That would have turned their season around. But I still am not convinced that they can completely do it. They're going to have a little bit of trouble starting off the season in 2016. Not to say that they're not going to improve because, ladies and gentlemen, Jason Clare is no joke of a coach. He has a UEFA B coaching license. UEFA is the top tier soccer organization in Europe. He coached Yevil Town in England, which is a championship side, one of the top sides in England right now. And they have a very, very good recruiting class. They got Lauren Thompson, who scored a couple of goals, showed that she has a little bit of a scoring boot, has a great leg. But Sarah Pope is gone, and she had nine points, two goals, five assists this season. And really, she was everything that you wanted from a number 10. But if we want to talk about someone that's going to be definitely missed, it's Jessie Parra. She's a defenseman, so she doesn't get on the board a lot. And a lot of the statistics don't really tell how much she is valued to this team. But if we're going to go with someone that's not really a true MVP on the stat line, but is a real MVP on the pitch, that's her. Because she does those ball clearances. She makes sure that she's in the right position. Every single time there's a big play involved, while Sarah Pope was there finishing it off or either putting the final touch on it before it gets finished off, Jesse Parra was the one starting it. She was a fantastic asset, and she's going to be missed. So as much of an improvement as they had, now it's up to the younger people who have shown that they've mm -hmm. done well to step up because it's not good when Brooklyn Minky is your second le as your leading scorer, I believe, with four goals. Yeah. And she only got scored in two games. She scored a hat trick, which is awesome. But I, th I think for them to really have improvement, which they will, I think Jason Clare will have them improve in 2016. They have to find their scoring boots. And I think that three-game win streak showed that they're capable of doing that. On top of, I think, them win uh, needing to find their more scoring, I think 
Finding and scoring is obviously the key, and that's going to what's going to win you games. But I think they have to play a little bit more consistently. I think throughout the entire season Absolutely. as well. The fact that Sarah Pope was your leading score, uh, leading point getter, and she only had nine, shows that you guys, the team, won games. A couple, there are a couple games, but they weren't scoring a lot of points. They were keeping it really good defensively throughout the entire season, keeping games low scoring. But you still have to be able to put the ball in the back of the net and get those couple games where you score maybe three or four times because. That gives you momentum not only going into that to finish that game off, but goes momentum into pr other games as well to show that, you know what, different guys on your team can score and different guys on the team can get you the ball to score and things like that. And I think that's going to be the biggest emphasis over the next couple months of the offseason and training and everything like that is finding the best ways for this team to become consistent. And I think that with the older uh, or with the younger players having a full year under their belt, or even two years for the sophomores, I think that's just going to improve as time goes on, and it's just going to be much better performance next year. I expect uh, upwards of maybe seven, eight wins. Yeah, you know, the defense had a lot of, uh, made a couple of silly mistakes this past season that led to goals. Rich, Janelle Richmond Bucola, the goalkeeper, played mm -hmm. most of the time. She has an, another year. And she year played all, of every game. I think she was eight, game, started 18 games, excuse me. Yeah, which is great because that gives her a full season of experience. And then Amanda Wenzel proved once again she could be a dynamic midfielder. So they're definitely onward and upward. Now we're going to switch gears, though, and discuss the men's soccer team. They made a Final Four appearance in 2014 but lost a lot of key players coming into this year. Many thought the team would lose a lot of the fight they had, but Coach Todd Padgett and the boys proved them wrong. Finishing second in the conference, only behind a Colorado Mines team that has yet to lose this season, and earning a bid into the NCAA tournament before losing to Midwestern State 4-2. But Bryce, were you surprised they even made it to the NCAA tournament this season? I'm going to say no, and I think the biggest reason why is Todd Padgett is legit. I think he is one of the best coaches uh, in the entire RMAC, in the entire school of Mesa, I'm going to put it that, that way as well, he knows what he's doing. He knows how to take a team uh, and get the most out of you can of every single player. He, he's very good at substitutions and knowing when to put guys in, who's going what for the matchup purposes, things like that. And honestly, you couldn't expect more from this team. Or you, The players that he got, he got the most out of all of them. I mean, freshmen were making impact night in, night out. James McGee. Oscar Ordiazola, Moshi Perez. I mean, these were guys legitimately making an impact game in, game out. And then when you combine that with the leadership of Blake Carlson on the defensive side, he's no joke either. I mean, he's won defensive, RMAC Defensive Player of the Year, I think, three times now uh, in preseason and everything like that. And then you have an outburst that Roy Abergill had and scoring 14 goals on the entire season, including four in the RMAC tournament. I don't know what else you could have said about this team. You know, obviously we would have liked to see them go even further, but I think that this just shows a Todd Padgett is doing everything he can with this team, and there's only up from here. I think is the other thing is you have all this team is all freshmen for the most part. Other than a couple, you're going to lose a couple seniors in the Escobar brothers, and then Blake Carlson. Those are going to be huge losses to this team. Don't get me wrong, but they have all these freshmen that have impacted these games on a high level as well. I mean, these are games going up against really tough competition. And so that's just going to be next year. They're going to be ready to go. And they're, they're ready to avenge the loss that they had uh, against both Mines as well as Midwestern State earlier in the season. And keep in mind that Midwestern State is very similar. Even yeah. Coach Todd Padgett said this. They are very similar to what the Mavericks were in 2014 when they reached the Final Four. They were full of experience and they were big guys. And that's exactly what the Mavericks were. So they lost to a team that was prime for a Final Four run. But I have, but uh, of course, actually, when you were on to talk about is this a surprise, as much as you want to say Todd Padgett is legit, and he is, I was definitely surprised that they still contended this well in the RMAC. They were supposed to finish fifth in the preseason poll in the conference, not in the nation, in the conference. And they started off not too well as w either. Briley Guarneri replacing both Mika Conrad's Brandon Bumpus. Mika Conrad's, mind you, the back-to-back -back goalkeeper of the conference in 2013-2014. Goalkeeping will c kill you if not done well. But Briley Guarneri, man, that guy is an amazing athlete. He, I mean, there was a goalkeeping controversy earlier in the season, but Guarneri shut that door very quickly. He has 11 shutouts this season. That's unheard of for a rookie goalkeeper. And then, like you said, these guys outside of Abergale, who is doing a fantastic job, just broke the record this season for most goals ever 
for a Maverick player for men's soccer. But behind him in points is also his fellow teammate from Israel, Moshi Perez. Then you also got Kevin Del Mazo. You got Oscar Odiazola. And Oscar Odiazola, the trained in the Chelsea FC uh, training youth academy, the same Chelsea FC that won the English cha championship last season. So these guys have done a fantastic job. To Coach Todd Padgett has reached from around the world in Asia, in Mexico, in a lot of other places to really find the best talent. And now it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next season because these guys have proven that they're not going anywhere. And Coach Todd Padgett said when he lost to Colorado School of Mines in the RMAC Championship, hey, no one thought that we were going to be here, so this is great. But now everyone does know that you're here. So the, the challenge for men's soccer is now everyone knows that you're legit. Now everyone knows that you're going to be a dominant force in the conference and perhaps nationally. Can you keep that consistency when teams aren't overshadowing you, especially early on in the season? Well, and too, the other thing that I look at this as well, every, every team that ever makes a push to be, become a champion, they always have that boulder that's in their way, and I think that that's going to be a uh, uh, school of minds, and that's going to be the test for this team, especially next season. They're the only team that they lost to in the entire conference, and so can they get past that boulder? Can they get over or move the immovable object, as they would probably look at it, considering the fact that they didn't lose a game the entire season? So it's going to be interesting to see how, how much emphasis, too, they put in the offseason on doing things to try and beat that um, Mines team. One of the biggest things that I know Blake Carlson was saying was they pushed them around a lot, and they were just out aggressive, uh, out bullied them and everything like that. So I think they're going to put a major emphasis on trying to come back stronger and play more aggressive throughout the game. Yeah, Coach Todd Padgett did say that this season, recruiting-wise, it was a lot of pace, a lot of speed, and it paid off. You have to replace the Escobar brothers in some sort mm -hmm. of ways. And those guys down the wings on the offensive end and on the defensive end, too, were just workhorses. And on the offensive end, any single time they put a cross into the 18-yard box, you knew that there was a chance that it was going to find the back of the net. But you also have Roy Abergill. And how can we not go into detail about this guy? 14 goals this season. How he didn't win RMAC yeah. Player of the Year is beyond me because this guy was fantastic. This guy also was the captain in the uh, NCAA tournament game, so he, he's proven that now he's going to be the leader. And I think that if this isn't his peak at 14 goals, the rest of the nation better watch out because he, mm -hmm. if he Im even slightly improves, he's going to have another phenomenal season. And Kevin Del Mazo, Ordiazola, Perez, McGee, McGee definitely has to step up. Also Eric Burton on that defensive end because now you don't have a towering 6'5 Blake Carlson to come save you if the team is a much more physical team. But Burton's not that bad height-wise too. But this is going, but if Roy Abergill can do well and Burton and those boys can do a great job with the, on the defensive end, just like Meso has been throughout the last two seasons, we could be looking at the future RMAC champions and another contender for a national championship. We are halfway there, ladies and gentlemen, and we will take a quick, quick break. But when we return, we will talk basketball and if football was wrongfully snubbed. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Last Down. We just finished talking about CMU soccer teams, but now we transition from the pitch to the hardwood as both men's and women's basketball just had their seasons start this past weekend. The women's team is coming off an RMAC regular season title last year, and while the men didn't reach that goal, they'll be looking to send senior Ryan Stefanoff with a bang. So Bryce, how will both basketball seasons be going down this year? Well, to start things off, I think the women's team I think that their expectation is set there. They should win the RMAC tournament once again. Uh, well, RMAC regular season title, excuse me, again. And then I think that they want to avenge their loss in the RMAC tournament last year and win their, another RMAC tournament for this squad. Uh, you know, they've got a lot of guys returning this year, but they also have a lot of new faces as well. And so it's going to be interesting to see just how well this team plays together. Uh, through their first two games, they're going one and one, and they lost to a number nine team in West Texas A&M. But they did play this game without their probably arguably best player in Aaron Richley, who is injured with her foot injury. Uh, and so 
it's just going to be interesting to see because I think the biggest thing that they're going to need is guys to step up outside of Aaron, especially while she's out. And, you know, Sydney Small did that in her first at time action this uh, past weekend, scoring 29 points, 21 in the second half in one of the games. And so it's just going to be interesting to see how well, because I think this defense or this team's defense has been the biggest thing for them over the past couple of years. And so now it's going to be interesting to see how much their offense has improved and if they're going to be able to put up points against really tough defenses because that was the really struggle that they had in the RMAC tournament was they just couldn't get leads because they couldn't score any points. Their defense was fine. They were holding teams to poor shooting nights, poor offensive production nights, but they just couldn't get it going themselves. And then the couple times that they were able to get it going, they just couldn't get keep it going. They could only get it for maybe a quarter, even half of a quarter. And then a couple other times their biggest problem was when they did get it going, they then let off, off the gas, and that allowed the other team, the opponent, to get back into the game, tie things up. And then from that point on, it was just a rough, rough time for the women's team. Yeah, and this team definitely has talent. I mean, Sydney Small and Erica Musante both won RMAG Offensive and Defensive Player of the Week, respectively. And Sydney Small really came alive. She scored averaging 21 points per game in the first two games, so she's a very good offensive threat. But like you said, the pressure is definitely on the Lady Mavs because their only loss at home in 51 games came in that RMAC tournament. So that's going to be a bitter pill to swallow coming into this season. That's got to be very frustrating if you are the Lady Mavericks to go. We did everything we could, and then we lost one game, and we, have, and we couldn't finish out the double which really the, only, the best team in the RMAC that, that season and this season is the Colorado Mesa women's basketball team. And Aaron Richley being out could be a big hit, but they, they're working on their game and they're working on avoiding turnovers. And I think that's the one thing that Coach Wagner was frustrated with in the loss to West Texas A&M. It wasn't a bad loss at all. And as a matter of fact, throughout the majority of the game, the women's mm -hmm. team, the Lady Mavericks were leading the were leading West Texas A&M. So I mean, what and just bad turnovers led to them losing that game. And Coach Wagner and the rest of the girls were frustrated. So coming into our MAC play here pretty soon is going to be interesting to see. They're working out their little kinks here and there. And if they get those kinks worked out, it's going to be a scary team again. And it's going to be another season filled with success for this women's basketball team. Let's, yeah. let's transition now to the men's, though. Let's talk about Ryan hmm. Steffen and what he has contributed. Now he really, it's his last year. He's the only senior on this squad. There's a bunch of new faces. Bryce, you actually sat down with Ryan Steffen. So what's his mentality coming into this season, and how's the men's team shaping up this year? Well, so the biggest thing, the biggest thing I got from talking with Ryan Steffen earlier last week was, you know, this team is completely new. They have 10 new signees that they've brought in. You know, Ryan Steffen is the only senior that's going to be getting a majority of playing time throughout the entire season. And honestly, he's the only player basically on this team that anybody else in the entire conference is going to know. And so everybody's going to be building their game plans around trying to stop this guy. It hasn't start, uh, helped this much into the season. Only through two games, he's averaging 34 points a game. But despite that fact, He's going to be the biggest point of defensive emphasis for other teams coming in. So it's going to be interesting to see how these other 10 new signees are able to take some of that pressure off of Ryan and not force him to have to score 30 plus points a game to be able to stay in games and win games. You know, watching them in practice, they have a lot of good shooters on this team. Uh, Derek Bialy is a very good assist man. He can find you. Uh, you know, they have a lot of guys in a lot of depth, I think, with these 10 new signees. It's just going to be a matter of who plays well with who and who's going to be able to contribute and contribute on both the offensive and defensive sides of the ball. And, you know, the RMAC for the men's side is completely wide open. Everybody knows it from the fact that with Derek White leaving UCCS, this entire conference is open. Most of, the other, most of the teams are like the Mavericks in the sense of nobody knows who anybody has anymore. Everybody's trying to work in their new freshmen, their new sophomores, their redshirted guys. And so it, this, this division, any, it's up for the grabs. And so it's going to be interesting to see Ryan Steffen emphasize he wants to leave here at champion, whether that be RMAC tournament, RMAC regular season, or both. I mean, both is obviously the goal and then to go into the NCAA tournament. But there's a lot of stuff that this team has to do to get to that point. 
And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for it as well, knowing that you're going into these games in the RMAC, and there, a lot of these teams are in the same position that you are, so you just have to be the ones to take advantage. And quite honestly, we still probably have the best player on the entire court most of the time in Ryan Steffen and what he's able to do both offensively, defensively, rebounding the ball, everything like that. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, this is the Wild West, and no one really knows what they're made of. But we do know one thing, and that's Ryan Steffen can ball. But offensively, they're going to have to find people that can step up. Like you said, Julian Vasquez is gone. Jerry Duckworth is gone. And so is Lander Vermeer. So three of your top four leading scores per game are gone now. So it's going to be a challenge for them to find another score outside of Ryan Steffen. But if they can do that and they can really find their mold and Ryan Steffen can step up and play like he has been and like he has earlier on in the season, maybe, just maybe, this could be a fairy tale ending for the big man here at CMU. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have entered our last down and let the controversy begin. After a 9-2 season, the Mavericks football team hoped that they earned a bid into the NCAA tournament. Sadly, Texas A&M Commerce was selected instead, and many journalists covering NCAA Division II call our absence a snub. Bryce, do you agree with the, with the NCAA two journalists that it was a snub? You could say this is bias all you want. Yeah. But yes, we absolutely got snubbed in this decision. There's no doubt about it. What else do you want this team to do? We, okay, we went 9-2. and two. Sorry, okay, we did lose two games. The two games we lost, West, uh, Western State, who ended up winning the, uh, they were the, the, in, top seed the top seed in the entire region, only lost one game on the entire year. And we took that game to overtime, which we lost 16 13, and we lost our starting quarterback in Sean Rube Cobble in the first half. So we had, if we had Sean in the entire game, there's a very good chance we win that game. And then, yes, we did lose pretty badly to CSU Pueblo, who are, I'm sorry, the defaining reigning national champions. And once again, we had to play the game without Sean Rube Cobble for the majority of the time. I don't know what else you wanted this team to do. I know the other team, the uh, Texas Sam that got in, was the only team to beat Westminster, or yeah. sorry, Western State. But still, I mean, what else did you want this team to do? This team was probably the best defensive team in the entire conference, if not probably one of the best in the entire region. Now, I know I can't say that because I haven't seen a lot of the other teams outside of the RMAC. But at the same time, you know, offensively, we improved vastly. We've got Dustin Revis and Salim Claghorn in that powerhouse secondary. Tom Sager in the linebacking core. Uh, that front four that was putting pressure on everybody. We allowed a season-high 24 points or 26 points heading into the Thunderwolves game, which we allowed, what was it, 52 or something like that. But still, I mean, what else did you want this team to show you for them to get in this, in, in this tournament? All right, before, before I say anything, Texas A&M, like you said, were the only team to beat Midwestern State, and that's huge. That's a huge win, and in NCAA, the selection committee definitely values big wins like that. Also, the Mavericks did lose, albeit to the national champions, CSU, Pueblo, Thunderwolves, they lost pretty badly. That, and also West Texas A&M did only have, uh, had eight wins and two losses. Mavericks had nine wins and two losses, but you can't really blame West Texas A&M for having w one less game on their schedule. All of that said, this was definitely a snub. How can you not put the CMU Mavericks in? They, outside of two games, which, like Bryce said, were without our starting quarterback, we lost two. And the second loss for West Texas A&M came against a three-loss Sam Houston State. And that's the biggest thing that I, I'm frustrated with with the selection committee. We had a perfect scenario laid out for you, okay? You had West Texas A&M, or Commerce, having just one loss, so if they beat Sam Houston State in the season finale, they would have gotten in. And ma the Mavericks had to pray that they beat Western State and that they M West Texas A&M lost. They would have hoped to have to win out in that scenario. What happened? The Mavericks won. West Texas A&M lost. Both had an opportunity to reach up and grab the final spot. And while the Mavericks were able to clinch it, West Texas A&M slipped on the ladder and fell down hard. And that's the biggest frustrating thing. And there are such a thing as good losses. I don't agree with the whole, well, there's, there's, there's bad losses to good teams. There is, but we have, we have a legitimately big reason why we lost to these teams. 
it was because Sean Rubacaba was out. And I know we keep on emphasizing this, but if you haven't seen the Mavericks play, then you haven't seen how much of a difference it is. No disrespect to Eric Kaiser, very good quarterback in for the Mavericks. But when Sean Rubacaba is there, what he proved this season is that he is a definite playmaker that can make things happen that no one in the quarterback position for CMU before in my time that I've been here has been able to do so. Mm -hmm. And the defense, they had Jackson Burrell, they had Salim Cleghorn, they had Dustin Rivas, all had five interceptions. Those three people had 15 interceptions. That defense was fantastic. You knew every single time that the Mavericks stepped onto that football field that you had to watch out for their defense because they can make plays happen. I don't know how they didn't get into the NCAA tournament. It is a definite snub. And now they've already started the hashtag unfinished business 2016 for next season. You can tell these players are pretty fired up for not getting into this tournament. Yeah, I mean, the defense is averaging an average of 17 points per game, while our offense is averaging 34 points per game. So to say that when Sean Rubicaba went down was not a huge loss, it was a huge loss. This team last season was not averaging anywhere near 34 points a game. So without him in the lineup, that was huge. And so then, yeah, exactly what you said. Defense was just outstanding. I don't know what this team could have done differently other than win those possible two games. I'm sorry our quarterback did get hurt. I'm sorry, you know, we did lose to the national defend uh, reigning national uh, champions. But if nothing else, this does give this team a lot of momentum possibly heading into next season. We do lose a lot of yeah, guys, though, which is going to be very concerning, especially in that secondary. I think Dustin Revis is the only one of that four that is returning, and so it's going to be interesting to see. We do get another year of Sean Rubkaba, so hopefully he does get healthy, uh, as he did sustain an injury in that final game against CSU Pueblo. So it's going to be interesting to see what we can do with the offense. Uh, we're losing DJ Hubbard, but David Tan looked pretty good, especially at the end of the season, so hopefully he'll return to that running back role. It's just going to be an interesting year for the Mavericks, and whether or not they have a, they have a lot riding on them. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just heartbreaking because you saw all these seniors that – put up with the constant losing seasons. And then when they finally turned their program around and really made a statement in the entire nation, they didn't get in, which is one of the things I really do hate about college football yeah. all around is that the selection committee just basically, it's up to it's up to them. And it's better than a computer, but sometimes you get these heartbreaking results. All right, folks, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Check back with us next time for all the in the wide world of sports with Bryce Reedy. I am Joe Azar. Have a great week and enjoy watching sports guys.